way in which we can save the world. And what's wrong with the world? This is what's wrong with the world. Uh, here are a few pictures of recent extreme weather events. Um, you've got flooding in the UK up in the top left. That's in, that's in Yorkshire um, not long ago. You've got a church spire breaking off due to the ferocity of some of the storms. Um, top middle, that's in Brazil. That's a mudslide um, due, to, due to that city receiving a month's worth of rain in one day. Houses destroyed, people died. In the middle, you can see a lake. That's in Kenya. And there are graves gravestones you can see in that lake. That's not normal, is it? That's because the lake is rising every year due to the changed rainfall patterns in, in that part of, of the north of Kenya. And people can't go and perform the normal funeral rites and everything that they would normally do. Um, in the bottom, that is in Bangladesh. That's a woman pointing out towards what used to be her vegetable fields and her rice paddies and is now a lake. Uh, top right, that's a cow um, standing in the middle of a pond or what used to be pasture for that cow. Uh, and the cows are dying, people are losing their livelihoods, that's in Mexico. And in the bottom right, uh, that's a woman in the Gambia in West Africa standing in what used to be her house. Yeah. So, this is why it's happening, okay? Uh, that equation says that the rise in temperatures, delta T, yeah, global heating, don't say global warming anymore, yeah, sounds too wishy-washy. Global heating is dependent on E, which means the amount of carbon dioxide that we are chucking out into the atmosphere, and F, which is any other things that we are doing to make global temperatures increase. So that could be other greenhouse gases, you know, uh, methane, for example, um, CFCs, which hardly get put out anymore, but they also contributed to that as well as to killing the ozone layer. And K and alpha are just constants which we chuck in there to make the units come out correctly, okay? Don't worry about those. Global heating is due to carbon dioxide and other things, okay? This is not controversial anymore. Uh, Mr. Tamlin introduced me talking about uh, how, uh, how our parents' generation talked to us about what needed to be done. And back then, there were still people who said, no, 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 these are blips. Yeah. Uh, global heating is not real. Yeah. Um, this, this is the graph, as up-to-date as I could find, goes to the end of 2020. And basically, what you've got here is uh, red equals orange plus blue, okay? Red is the actual warming that we have measured, okay? Smoothed out. The black is the actual observations. The red is that line smoothed out. The blue line wiggling along the bottom there is natural variations in temperature. And the orange one is what we have caused. Yeah? So you add in the natural variation and the orange one, and you get the red line. That is global heating. Yeah. And as you can see, that graph has not, as far as you can tell, reached a point of inflection. Uh, it's still going up and up and up. Okay. And this graph tells you whether it's E or F in that equation that's more important. Yeah? Should we be focusing on reducing the amount of carbon dioxide, or should we be focusing on something else? Okay, so the solid gray bit at the bottom of that graph is the carbon dioxide, and the slightly paler gray bit above it is everything else. Okay, so you look at that equation, and it's carbon dioxide that we need to do something about. Okay, uh, if you read about, um, uh, you know, any, any, other, any other issues you see, like, oh, we've got to reduce the amount of, uh, of methane emitted um, by cutting down on the amount of beef we eat because cows fart and emit methane into the atmosphere. That's true, okay? And for many other reasons, perhaps we should be eating less red meat. Um, but that's not going to help compared to the efforts that need to be done to reduce the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Okay? Uh, so how are we doing? Are we making 
some progress. Are we perhaps going to make this graph begin to level off and come down? Um, these are fossil fuel production uh, forecasts. Okay? Uh, if we want the rise in temperature to be limited to approximately 1.5 degrees, then our production of fossil fuels needs to follow the blue line. Okay? If we think we can get away with allowing global temperatures to rise by about two degrees, then we need our fossil fuel production to decrease according to the orange line. It's not quite so steep, not quite so difficult. And the red line shows what we're actually planning to do. This was at the time of COP26 last year, uh, not very many months ago. Uh, uh, this is how much notice governments are taking of the need to reduce carbon dioxide. Okay? Uh, all those pictures that I showed you, apart from the ones I picked in the UK, because they speak to me, most of them are in the developing world, and the climate crisis is hitting the developing world harder, uh, but it's going to come and, and hit us all before long, yeah, particularly if that's the best we can do. Well, uh, what is being done? There are efforts being made to reduce CO2 emissions, aren't there? We are bringing more and more renewable sources into the electrical power generation industry, for example. Okay? Uh, there are attempts to capture CO2 that's already in the atmosphere. There are some technological ways of doing this, but they don't work very well so far. And some countries, some groups are trying to reforest areas, plant more trees to make up for the ones that we're cutting down. Okay? And there are more and more serious efforts into what's called geoengineering, which is um, a term we use to mean large scale ways to try and adjust the Earth's climate deliberately, such as uh, you know, building some kind of great shield to divert some, not all, of the sun's radiation. Uh, kind of like living in Highlander 2, was it? Highlander 3? I don't know. Um, these ideas may work, but they may also have unintended consequences. This is a problem, of course, with new technologies. And there isn't a lot of time to see whether any of these are going to work properly. I don't mean that these are useless, and maybe some of you are hoping to end up working in these areas, and that's a wonderful thing, but I've only got a certain amount of time. Um, so, hello? Yeah, uh, rather than some of these, which are ways in which we're trying to produce less CO2, okay, uh, more nuclear power stations, is that a safe thing? Are we going to get more Fukushimas? Or is that because, oh, you know, in Japan, of course, they, they don't pay proper attention to safety. Uh, they have earthquakes. The rest of the world doesn't. No, that can't happen anywhere else. Or should we be playing safe and reduce the number of um, fission stations? Or renewables, as I said. In transport, this is another large source of CO2. Well, more and more electric cars, more and more hybrid cars. That's a good thing. Uh, some cities around the world have made headlines with their fleets of buses, public buses that, that run on hydrogen, for example. Um, and these are also good things, but they're not addressing enough of the problem. There are still too many petrol cars and diesel cars, and those aren't the only ways we get around, are they? Uh, how, many, um, how many hours do we all spend in aeroplanes every year? Not as many as we used to for staff traveling to other countries around the world, but it's uh, a lot and battery-powered aeroplanes are not on the horizon. Battery-powered ships crisscrossing the world, delivering our goods, are not on the horizon. They use hydrocarbons. They're going to use hydrocarbons for the foreseeable future. Uh, so I want to look at this today. This is one way in which we might be able to save the world uh, a bit quicker. You, you've heard of nuclear fusion. Um, getting energy from atomic nuclei happens in two ways. Nuclear fission, which we already do, we do it in the nuclear power stations, works by uh, inducing a nucleus to break apart. The mass of the product is less than the mass of what you started with. That missing mass has become energy. Okay? And fusion, as some of you know, works the opposite way. We crash atomic nuclei together, 
and again, the result in mass is slightly less than the sum of what went in. That missing mass has become energy. And you may have heard that the idea with nuclear fusion is to replicate what happens in the sun. In the sun, nuclear fusion does happen. This happens. You can see four protons at the top. And then on the second row, another two protons join in, one on each side. Okay, we get helium-3 nuclei, those fuse together, and at the bottom we get one helium-4 nucleus, and two of those six protons come off and are free to join in another reaction. So the effect is that we're getting helium out of four protons. Helium weighs less than four protons. The missing mass uh, is approximately 26 mega electron volts per uh, per set of four protons that goes in, and that's a large number, okay? It means we only need 250 billion of these reactions to happen to get one joule of energy, okay? Uh, that might not seem like a large number, one 250 billionth of a joule, but just getting that from four protons is, um, is a big deal. Okay, that's only 0.6% of the mass of those original four protons, yeah? but it's a lot. Uh, that's not the only process in the sun that makes the sun shine and gives us the energy, but it accounts for most of it. So I'm going to say that's what happens in the sun. That is the principal process that supports life on Earth. Okay, uh, wouldn't it be a, a nice kind of circle if I could say yes, and this is also the process that we are going to use to safeguard life on Earth by building nuclear fusion power stations that do this rather than burn, uh, burn hydrocarbons. Um, sadly, it's not quite right. I'm going to be fussy. Um, this is what nuclear fusion reactors that we're building on Earth are attempting to do. They collide not two protons together and then... Uh, on that side, another two over here, and crash them together like the proton-proton reaction. They crash a deuterium nucleus and a tritium nucleus together, hydrogen-2 and hydrogen-3. Um, and you can see the result there is uh, 17 and a half mega electron volts. It's not quite as much as you get from the proton-proton reaction, but it's still a nice big number, and this is a much easier process to achieve. Um, again, a lot of you will know the reason fusion is difficult is because you are trying to collide particles that are both positively charged. And Coulomb's law says that two positive charges uh, have a repulsive force between them, and we have to get over that barrier. We have to crash the particles together so fast uh, that they overcome that Coulomb repulsion and get so close that the nuclear forces take over uh, and the nuclear forces are attractive. Okay, that barrier in this process is only about 0.1 mega electron volts. So, prima facie, you say to yourselves, oh, okay, that should not be too hard. We should be able to get a lot more energy out than we need to put in. And yes, logic says we should, but it's hard. Okay. Um, so, you need to start with a state of matter called the plasma. This is what you get if you keep heating, right? You heat a solid, it melts, you get a liquid. You heat a liquid, it boils, you get a gas. You heat a gas, and eventually the electrons have enough energy to separate from their parent atoms, and you get positive ions, the nucleus, okay? And you get the electrons separated. They no longer have any connection with each other, okay? It happens, I just liked this picture of lightning. Um, lightning does create a small amount of plasma. Lightning heats up the air around it to about perhaps 30,000 Kelvin, okay? Um, which if you convert that into electron volts, uh, we, we sometimes measure temperature in electron volts when we're doing fusion uh, because it's just another measure of the, the speed, right? You accelerate particles, you know, how much energy have they got, uh, measure it in electron volts. And you know that the ionization of hydrogen, for example, is about 13, 13.6 13 or something electron volts. 30,000 Kelvin corresponds to approximately three electron volts, okay? So when you get a lightning strike, most of the air around each fork doesn't become plasma, but you get some, right, because it's, it's an average. It's nowhere near enough, okay? In a fusion reactor, we need roughly 100 million Kelvin. Yeah, 
100 million. We need it to be about 3,000 times hotter than a bolt of lightning. And of course, we need it to be safe. We need to be able to control it. We need to be able to push buttons and make sure that it's all being, uh, being looked after carefully. So it's very, very hard. Uh, What's my point before I go on? Yeah, so, but the point is that because a plasma is made of separated electrons and positive ions, everything in it is charged. Since everything in it is charged, we can use electric fields and magnetic fields to control where it goes. Okay, so this idea was recognized uh, quite a long time ago now, and the first attempts to actually build a container, if you like, or a building that could, uh, could control the movement of a plasma um, happened mostly in the Soviet Union back in the uh, ooh, early 50s, I should say. And this is what they were thinking to themselves, right? If we can get fusion to work, we can achieve cheap energy. Back then, there wasn't any climate crisis, but still, cheap energy is good. Yeah? Nuclear fuel has a much higher energy density than anything else. It means we get much more energy compared to the volume of fuel that we use, or you could also call it uh, specific energy, energy per kilogram of fuel that we use. Fusion is better even than nuclear fission in that regard, and fission is uh, hundreds of thousands of times better than your hydrocarbons, your biofuels, or even if you convert renewable energy into that sort of number. Uh, it is a lot safer to use fusion rather than fission because you don't end up with radioactive byproducts, yeah, or nearly none. You do get a certain amount of tritium, which is radioactive as a byproduct, but the half-life of tritium is only about 12 years compared to the half-life of the transuranic elements that you get out of a fission power station, which have half-lives of hundreds or thousands of years. All right? So we're confident that we can do that. We can arrange safe disposal and storage of the byproducts of a fusion station um, and, and not have to worry about leaving our descendants no-go areas in the world. And the fuel that we use, uh, you get deuterium from seawater. It's not difficult to get. Uh, the tritium you need to get from other sources, but again, not, not expensive. Uh, so that's what it looks like. That's called a tokamak. Uh, tokamak is an acronym in Russian for a donut-shaped room with magnetic fields in it. Okay. Uh, you mathematicians are guessing that the to bit is toroid or torus, right? That's donut. And this is the one that was in the news the other day for achieving a world record amount of energy. It's in Oxfordshire in the UK. It's called the Joint European Taurus or JET. Uh, even though Brexit happened, right? Uh, this is still a European collaboration. Uh, and you can see the shape, okay? So this is the room where the plasma goes, okay? But 100 million Kelvin, you don't want the plasma to be touching the sides of the room, okay? It's made of metal. Metal is not able to withstand temperatures of 100 million Kelvin. So this is where the idea of controlling the plasma using electric and magnetic fields comes in, okay? Without the plasma touching the walls, you can nevertheless control the ring path that it takes. It goes round the bottom of the chamber, I'll show you a short clip in a moment, okay? And the, uh, one of the great difficulties in arranging this is the shape that you need. If you have charged particles moving in a magnetic field, yeah, then uh, you can set up a solenoid and they will run through the center of the solenoid. You bend the solenoid round on itself and hey presto, you've got a donut and they will basically run round and round in a ring. It's a little more complicated and you want them to crash into each other because remember, that's what we're trying to achieve here. Yeah, we're trying to achieve fusion. So if you've got enough plasma and they're all following approximately circles, if you've got enough, then you can expect fusion and energy to be produced. Uh, where are we? Yeah, um, the, uh, the tokamak at JET in Oxfordshire is very successful. Okay, it's reached world records for the amount of energy that can be produced and also for 
how close they've got to what we call the break-even point with Fusion. The trouble with Fusion is that it's so expensive to, or in terms of money and in terms of energy, to put in the amount of energy that we need to control the plasma, to run the superconducting magnets that generate the magnetic field to keep the plasma in the right place. And we have never managed to achieve break even. In other words, to get out as much energy as we put in. And until we do do that, of course, then nuclear fusion is just going to be absorbing energy from the grid, which runs on hydrocarbons and contribute to ruining the world. To save the world, we've got to get past uh, what they call the, the, the Q value of one. We've got to get a larger number on the numerator of the fraction than the denominator. Um, this place, way back in the 1990s, reached what is still the record, a Q value of 0 0.67. They got two thirds as much energy out as they put in. And since then, they've kind of left that Q value on the back burner and they've been going for how much energy can they get out. And that was what was reached last week uh, when they got a 59 megajoule uh, quantity of energy out after running the thing for just five seconds. Okay, and that's, that's good going but we're not there yet. The next generation of fusion plants uh, are supposed to reach break even, although even that is not commercial operation. Uh, the next one that will probably do it is a collaboration called ITER in the south of France, International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor or something. Uh, and they talk to each other. Yeah? The scientists collaborate, they use data from one experiment, the one in Oxford and the one in France are not the only ones, obviously you've got them in the uh, US, in Asia, in Russia as well and ideas and, and uh, you know, new tweaks are incorporated as ITER is built and developed. Uh, this is just another cutaway uh, uh, image of what the, what the tokamak looks like. Yeah. Um, and now I'm gonna show you a, a short clip. It's not amazing, you're not gonna gasp, but this is the world record for fusion power at the moment. That's it, that's your 100 million Kelvin pulse of 59 megajoules of energy from nuclear fusion. That's the best we can do at the moment, but research continues. But when are we going to get there? Uh, it's been said for decades, since the 40s in fact, that nuclear fusion is going to be a thing in 30 years time, and people are still saying it. ITER is meant to come online in the middle of the next decade, about 2035, commercial reactors in the 2040s. So perhaps we're now saying 20 years rather than 30. But there's another possible answer. Uh, that's Lev Artimovich, who was one of the team in the Soviet Union that developed the first tokamak, and it was in his laboratory that fusion was first achieved, uh, apart from the sun. And when he was asked, when is nuclear fusion going to be ready? His answer was, it'll be ready when society needs it. And I'm just kind of hoping that he's right. That's all. Thank you very much. <laughs>